la réponse des réassureurs à la pandémie, résilience et innovation. Welcome back et bienvenue à... Welcome to this uh, session on this, this session of the Casablanca Insurance Meeting. This is the final afternoon, so we will be start uh, having a talk with the reinsurers. They're the ones that suffered the most from this uh, pandemic. Uh, so Mr. Rousseau is a member of the executive uh, uh, committee of Skor Group, uh, and uh, he will be uh, talking to us about the response to reinsurers uh, to, with regard to the pandemic. So I have a few questions to ask you. And uh, it's important to note in the context of a pandemic, and so when risks uh, mainstream generalize and cover everyone, well, insurers turn to reinsurers, but who do reinsurers turn to? So we are eager to hear what you'll have to say. So thank you very much for this invitation. I'm delighted to be able to take the floor here during the Casablanca insurance meeting. So I'll, maybe we'll start by answering your question before jumping into the um, presentation that I prepared. So they turn to their customers uh, and this is a key um, challenge for reinsurers. So generally reinsurers insure insurers. And the question is to see how to, the idea is to ensure that they aren't too far from the risk. So they first turn to their customers, so to the risk, first and foremost, and then obviously they turn to the um, sound, the soundness of their balance sheets. As far as the response to reinsurance, so, um, resilience and innovation, so I prepared two uh, preliminary comments. So the first is a historical perspective. It's important to note that reinsurance, as we know it today, was born in the 19th century as a financer of the Industrial Revolution. So to finance uh, infrastructure projects that uh, German and Swiss uh, reinsurance companies were created. So reinsurance was born uh, following these uh, projects to, that were meant to finance a revolution. And so uh, given this uh, participation of reinsurers to this technological revolution is quite interesting. This is why a reinsurer generally intersects between three trades. So as an entrepreneur would, to understand and support these clients. Um, to, and so in this sense, they can also be engineers to truly understand the uh, underlying risks and then also a mathematician because the, the idea here is mod I mean, it's a question of modeling. And so and the absorption of risks which requires this modeling. And finally, which begs the question of the uh, the relationship with public power. So reinsurers intervene um, as a supplement and or sometimes uh, com compete with public powers or, and this is something that we see in, through national, uh, national reinsurers or, or, or mandatory uh, transfers. So there's sort of intersection between the public and private spheres. And so I believe that these solutions to the pandemic uh, with regard to the uh, relationship with reinsurance and the public sector is quite important. So my second uh, uh, introductory remark rel relates to the more, to the characteristics of this uh, crisis. So this is a pandemic is a is a, has a biometric uh, notion and so it's the first time that we have such a pandemic in the, in modern times so the last pandemic dates back to the Spanish flu in the early uh, 20th century. And so this is a crisis that we could qualify as biometric but Took, um, but ended up being uh, happening, occurring at a much larger scale when we see the claims that are avoided by insurers and reinsurers. So the biometric risk for life, life segment only represents 10% of the business. So 90% is uh, business is is bond insurance or property and casualty insurance or general liability. So we witnessed a real surprise, over, a real surprise over the last 10 months. So most people were expecting a mortality crisis. But what's interesting is that there's much, there is a property and casualty insurance that uh, is prevalent. So it's obviously there are there was the canceling of major events such as the Olympics or the coverage of, of business interruption. Um, covers so these are two sources of risk that were that were prevalent and so 
other the other questions that are that that are posed are are general liability and uh, bondage. And so this uh, crisis is unique in its uh, spatial and its in terms of space and time. I mean, it is global and it, from a time standpoint because it's been going on for more than a year. So if these are claims that are stand between forty and one hundred million dollars, and so. We were at about 30, 35 billion dollars today. This doesn't mean that the crisis won't be as strong as expected, but this just means that there weren't as many claims reported. So the situation that reinsurers are in today is that there is a multiplicity and an increase of the frequency of uh, of of these claims. So over the past ten years, we've had natural or human events that uh, multiply and increase so which leads to the question on uh, regarding the resistance and this is different from resilience it's the and so in fact so there's the question of resistance up until certain points and so which also leads to the question on resilience so how do we manage to resist and to and to uh, and to handle the handle the, the the shock on the on the balance sheet. So this is the first added value. But if their rule role only is limited to that, well, reinsurers won't necessarily provide sufficient value to their customers. So to give you a simple answer to the question that's asked to me today on the role of reinsurers, I would first of all focus on this uh, financial stability to absorb shocks and to be able to face this uh, this growing risk <laughs> this growing risk. And the sustainability, and the, the, so with regards to sustainability, well, it's a question of, of expertise. So this was my first answer. We need to know. We need to know our customers. We need to know the risk. So this the expertise of the reinsurers is necessary to be able to have access to the risk, and we also need to be able to and then indemnify this risk. So I think in market economies, this is particularly complex uh, to be able to explain to explain to an insured and the insurers the real cost of the risk. So the first answer on the role of the reinsurer is the financial stability. The second, was it, which is essential if you wish to be a leader on our market, is to be able to help our customers develop. How do reinsurers, I mean, not only position themselves as risk leaders, but supporters of insurance companies and of the economy in general to help them develop? So here we're talking about the development of products, of services, and Technology obviously has a key role to play. So I'll give you a real example, a Moroccan example, uh, where SCORE invests a lot of time and a lot of resources in re partnerships that are truly interesting. And so these are agricultural risks. So Morocco has announced in 2008 the Green Morocco Plan, and in 2020 the, the Green Generation was also launched. So to, uh, there's a real public impetus that uh, places the agricultural industry at the heart of the country's development. And so this public impetus is absolutely ne necessary and this is something that we can witness in Morocco and many other countries. And often the public authorities are at the do spur these uh, types of initiatives. So I'd like to give you the example of a small company, a, a suite, uh, which was uh, started by two Moroccans, which in fact is a company that uh, handled on the one side from France, uh, from, excuse me, Morocco, but uh, whose ambitions go well beyond its Moroccan borders. And so the the uh, problem that they're trying to tackle is the lack of information of regarding agriculture. Uh, farmers and obviously agriculture plays a key role in M Morocco. And so, so we did the, the scope that we're working on with this company is the uh, risk of uh, citrus fruits, where there's the risk uh, with fruits are uh, very quite high. There's a real stake, there are major stakes. And so it's important to be able to uh, evaluate the, these claims such as droughts, I mean, we need to be able to detect the water stress that can occur in certain fields. And, and, and the fir first and foremost, the idea through this partnership is to be able to, to manage potential claims. So it's a service, not necessarily an insurance product. And so behind this claim management, this, agri uh, this agricultural risk, we the idea is to develop insur parametric insurance products whose, where the triggering of the claim is based on an index and not on a specific indemnity and to have insurance solutions or products that are innovative and that are made possible uh, through technology, through drones and satellites, where we can have a, a imaging of the of the plots of land and of soil that allow us to develop new products. And so, which leads us to major uh, 
pr producers that are covered and many more exporters will also be covered. And in the future, this is a key point that I intend to develop, to elaborate on. And so if we develop a, this product for citrus fruits and fruits in Morocco, well, we have a similar um, program in Brazil where we need to see the global dimension of the in reinsurance industry and also insurance. And this is where I think that uh, the national positions or protections are very are very i mean are are very dangerous for our uh, for our uh, industry and so th it's important to it's important to ensure that and reinsurance and insurance do have a real synergy. So, for example, for fruit, when we'll have a solution that will be effective on the Moroccan market, well, we can export the solution or products rather to to Turkey, to Brazil, for example. And conversely, the project that we're developing with Airbus and local Brazilian um, local Brazilian businesses will also benefit Morocco the day that we'll be able to develop this type of product in Morocco. And so this will be the conclusion of my presentation today. So the idea is to see what are the keys to success for uh, for the the intervention of, of reinsurance. So first of all, it's an open economy based on sharing, sharing of data, sharing of intellectual property. And here, I mean, the protectionists, uh, given that they're on, on rising everywhere, well, these these are because constitute a major threat. And so, globalization does allow for this uh, this uh, flexibility of capital. And so, the second priority is to be able to go to go through cycles in the uh, long term. So, the maybe long, shorter term players don't necessarily allow for remuneration of a risk or do not allow for the investment cycles such as what we're doing with uh, this uh, so with this uh, startup so the idea is to uh, to uh, partner up with a local insurer for example we can partner up with a Moroccan insurer and we will go and out and protect the insurer for this particular solution so there's an entire chain which allows us to I mean if we have some fronters that try to to get more rather shorter term uh, uh, benefits well this uh, th there's this does have a negative impact in the long run so the what's interesting is regulation and so the question is to see to which extent resilience is a factor of regulation so obviously and this is something we saw with the 2008 crisis after the financial crisis banks were were increasingly regulated. But I also believe that this regulation, this additional regulation can become excessive. And so when it becomes excessive, it is it is harmful to innovation and to this capacity to welcoming new players and to to have a different perception on insurance uh, products. So the the notion of the fair, of the, just the right amount of regulation and to have the right dose of protection and openness. And so this is also something that we see in these oversight of national regulators. We also see this in accounting standards. And so for those of you that took a look at IFRS 17 standards, well, they've already had to struggle. And for the rest, I wish them great luck. So the complexity of the accounting framework and the accounting standards are growing are expanding and so this is what makes these barriers which which increase the barriers to the insurance business i mean the so for example for solvency solvency with solvency two for the european countries and for um, moroccan countries are developing solvency frameworks that have a that where where there's a value an evaluation of assets and, and liability. So to answer your question and to conclude my presentation, so this long term partnership is essential between insured insurers, reinsurers, and the public authorities. And I think that the port partnership is truly the key word. And maybe it's it's overused. And so the reality is we are we are in trial on a trial and error phase. And so for we as reinsurers need to be able to access the underlying risks. On the other hand, we need to be able to obtain the 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 pricing uh, the pricing uh, the right pricing of the risk and this is what will allow us to have a uh, double a um, a double a uh, balance sheet so rating for our balance sheet so if i properly understood what you said is that uh, we reinsurers sometimes uh, um, intervene upstream to prevent risks and to educate the insured in such a way as to reduce the risk and so a sound use of the product, a sound use of materials, for example, and just developing uh, good habits uh, for corporates or farmers or individuals. So generally, insurers talk about having a preventive uh, measures. And so earlier we had the same discussion with Mr. Atali. 
are there insurance products that uh, maybe uh, are preventive products? So, for example, if I know that insurance applies to something that will be occurring in the future, but maybe we are preventive products, insurance products in, in, the, in the insurance uh, business's future. Now, in the framework of prevention, can, is insurance, will in the insurance business shift towards a new model or will we be, be creating new products? So this uh, this question of ex, exposed to ex ante risks or, well, I'm sure there, obviously there are, there are, we can see both effects. What I can tell you about the pandemic, uh, there were pandemic uh, pandemic products available, but they simply weren't sold. Nobody nobody uh, under took took out these types of, of insurance products. So the question that I think is important today, obviously we do need to manage the COVID crisis. It's so far from being over. Is the idea is to see whether there is a sufficient and real awareness on the necessity to take to share information and to to for example disclose the cyber attacks that the uh, insurance companies are are subjected to so they i mean as long as there isn't a crisis as long as people don't aren't don't experience a crisis or a risk while well, they don't there's no real awareness and so this is true that following this crisis we can turn to and we can start anticipating so i mean if a product is is unaffordable or too expensive or there isn't a real need, well, it won't generate interest. So, which leads me to the question. So, you will answer the question on COVID and whether it will change the models and whether the pandemic is insurable. And so, if I understood correctly, there are three types of major risks today that are a planet planet related risks. Well, there is the climate risk, there is the pandemic risk, and the cybersecurity risk. If we were to talk about global risks that are that are concerned the entire planet, so I will answer the question. I mean, it's true that the pandemic, I mean, involves the entire lead. I mean, calls calls upon the real shift in the shift of the insurance sector, and so there we, we there is a a. I mean, obviously, we see events that occur very rarely, but they have a very high cost, and so this is the first time. In, this is the first time that we see this, for example, in the life segment. So there's pricing that's reviewed. I mean, the extreme scenarios are reviewed, and so the pu purely life scenarios are also reviewed, but also with their with their, their correlation with property and casualty insurance. So, for example, when the pandemic started, it doesn't didn't really take much for the entire global global ecosystem to be disrupted. So with regard to the three, I do agree with the three risks that you mentioned, but I, I am afraid that there are others. I mean, I would also add one that is very imminently concrete and is political risk. And as you can see today, I mean, I'm based in Paris, uh, so I'm 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 speaking to you from the from my living room. So since yesterday, we have I mean, our the situation was has drastically tightened, in, and so there are some countries that that reacted in a zero COVID manner. For example, China or Korea had a very drastic responses, but many other countries, often that are quote unquote called dem democracies, and and don't necessarily have the political means or to to or to impose lockdowns or that would that could generate a zero covid situation situation and so this is this is why the many countries are are faced with this political risk the domestic risk but also geopolitical risks and uh, and I would say that this is a particularly high risk. I mean, this is something we witnessed in 2008. And so it started out by being, it started out, we started out with a financial crisis, which turned into an economic crisis. And then in the backdrop, we saw we saw the Arab Spring, we saw the, the European Union crisis. I mean, the sequencing of political risk is uh, particularly unforeseeable and it can occur upstream and downstream. So the lack of, I mean, the lack of reaction response in the in upstream and could also have repercussions in, the, in downstream. I would say that political risks are rank up pretty high up there and they are increasing. So thank you, Mr. Laurent. Thank you very much. And we hope that you'll be here with us for the eighth uh, Casablanca insurance meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So in a few moments, we will head over to the next uh, portion of our uh, Casablanca Insurance meeting. We will have another testimonial. We're delighted to have that. And as such, 
we will have the sixth round table with our next panelist. Thank you very much. Thank you.